minus three. And it means it's going to be Okay. No pressure. No pressure. I mean, as long as it won't last today, it's going to be one of them. Yeah, okay. Zoe will be able to set it all up. Oh, yeah. Okay. And she knows how to do it.
Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Adrena. Good morning, Gathering Place Church. Let's all, let's all stand and let's get ready to usher in the King, usher in his presence. Let's all stand and let's just turn our palms heavenward as a sign that our hearts are soft, our hearts are open, that we're in a posture of receptivity. But like our Pastor Josh says, and he's uh, he's uh, away this weekend with his family. But I love what he says. It's so true. He says, ex ex encounters require participation. And so you and I can sit actually in the presence of God and get nothing. Did you know that? That happened with Jesus all the time. God himself. There were people that were listening to Jesus teach and standing there, but because of their attitudes and their posture, they received nothing from the Son of God. But then there were those who were hungry and desperate, who would break through the crowd, grab a hold of his garment, and literally suck supernatural life out of him. One time he turned around and said, who touched me? Like, well, everybody touched me. He said, no, somebody touched me differently. And that woman got healed. You want to be touched by God today? Yeah. Yeah. Come on now. Let's do it. Come on. Let's, let's lift our hands heavenward. You at home, lift your hands. Come on. Just turn your palms open. Come on. Let's not be obstinate. Let's not be closed off. Let's not have attitudes. Let's be humble. Jesus said, if you want to receive the kingdom of God, you've got to come like a little child, trusting, uh, pliable, teachable, humble. Come on. Lord Jesus, it's hard down here. But thank God you have not left us alone. You have sent us your spirit. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. We invite you to touch our hearts because we all need it. We invite you to invade our thought process because we're wrong and you're right. We ask you to set us free today. Fill us up. We want to experience the presence of Almighty God in this place and online and everywhere where we are gathering as the Gathering Place Church and the body of Christ all over this city. Jesus, King Jesus, come and reign and rule in San Diego County. And in this place right here, as we lift up your praise, let your presence invade in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody shouted amen and gave God a praise offering. Come on. Come on. Let's get up in this. Let's do this. Let's go.
for your presence. All we want this morning, all we long for, is just to be able to sit and be feeling.
so good. John, are you a proud dad? I'm proud of you. Well, your daughter sounds like an angel. Yeah. She acts like one too. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but have you ever noticed that when John and Mark come up here, they never cry? <laughs> Do you know why? I am the hitman because we've been praying, we worship, and then we come up here and I'm supposed to speak. So this is why churches around the world have announcements, right? So the speaker, pastor, can kind of compose themselves. So you're welcome, okay? <laughs> um, we do have some very important announcements. Okay, we have a women's event. Yay! In person, live, coming up. It's going to be at the Blue Lava's home on the 17th of March and our own... Of April. Sorry. Um... 17th of this month, and our own MJ is going to be sharing a message that the Lord has given her, and it's going to be awesome. So, all the details are online. I encourage you, if you're a woman and you're here, sign up. Go. It will be fun, and you will be encouraged. I can guarantee you will be encouraged. We also have youth events. They are going to start meeting in person this week, Thursdays at the Williams Home. Awesome. 6.30, so again, details are online, and be there or be square. Okay? Um, orange Cheer. We're moving into the Orange Cheer from, I'm not sure what year we were in, but that means we can meet inside. Yay! So, uh, we'll be meeting here. Of course, this means we're going to have to learn how to do everything again, so we're not going to rush it. It's really nice out here. But over these next several weeks, the leadership team is going to be looking into the transition and how we might make that work. So, uh, good news, by the time it gets really hot, yeah, we'll get to the inside and we'll have air conditioning. Woo! Woo! Okay? And um, we don't really take an offering, but we'll talk about the offering. And I have, I have two pieces of really great news for you. Okay, when we give to the Lord, you know this. It's not like writing your tax check. But sometimes you look around and you think, oh, is that where my money is going? <laughs> I'm getting triggered. Okay, that's... <laughs> On the other end of the spectrum, okay, when we give to the Lord, and when you give to the Gathering Place Church, you can know that your money is going to be well stewarded. And we are giving our collective funds uh, to benevolence outreach here within our own body. We support local ministries and we're supporting ministries in our nation and around the world. Ministries, missionaries who are reaching unreached people who have never heard the name of Jesus and we're blessing them with our finances and our prayer. So you can know that when you are giving to the church you're giving toward making Jesus known and famous and honored in all the earth. Is that good news? Amen. Yeah, and we're, we're gaining treasures in, he in heaven. The other piece of good news, which I know you already know, but it's great to think about this, is we don't just give our funds and farm the outreach out to these awesome people out there somewhere that we never get to see. No, no, say no, no. 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 We get to be a part of it ourselves, Woo! okay? So there's something happening that's starting this Wednesday, April 13th. Does anyone know what it is? No. Ramadan. What? Is this a mosque? No. Say no. It's a church. Ramadan is the holy time of year for Muslim people. And there is a prayer movement of the body of Christ worldwide to pray for Muslims during this holy time of year for them. It begins on April 13th, and it runs through May 12th. It's 28 days. And we purchased some Muslim world prayer guides for you. These are awesome. We have a bunch of them over on the table, and I'll be over there, and I'm going to be handing them out after church. 
I encourage each one of you to take them. Did you know that since the beginning of this century, since the year 2000, more Muslims have come to Christ than in all of history combined? Woo! Wow. God has seen so much among Muslim people. Is there is the picture of my dad up on the screen? Oh, okay. Well, my parents just went on a ministry trip. Not to Florida. Guess where they went? Iraq. They went to Iraq. And they just got home last night. My dad sent me a picture of this young 19-year-old man who was his interpreter for the week. And he was from a Muslim family, of course. And uh, two years ago, the Lord Jesus visited him in a vision. And I don't know the details, but he became a Christ follower. And his family totally cut him off. But he is following Jesus joyfully and faithfully. Wow. So the Lord is doing things like this all around the world among Muslim people, including here in the United States. I took a class a number of years ago, and we were hearing about these types of things. And I asked the speaker, his name is Don McCurry, who's actually featured in this book. Is this like a new thing that God is doing, or has he always been doing this, that we just didn't hear about it? And he said, his answer was fascinating to me. Of course, you can't prove these things, but he, his answer was, the body of Christ has begun to pray for Muslim people like never before. And these types of stories, this is how God is answering. And he's doing it all over the world. And we get to be a part of praying of what God is doing among these Muslims. And this book, it's really neat. This, this is focusing on different groups of Muslim people who are here in the United States. So um, it's like Muslims who are students, Muslims who are living in New York, this group of Somali refugees over here. Guess what? These people who live here talk with their families all the time who are back home. So when we reach the people who are here, we're, we're blessing the ends of the earth as well. So um, let's pray for our offering, and um, I want to pray for us that God would burden us to pray, because when we pray, God works, okay? So Lord, we love you so much. We are grateful to be a part of your family, grateful for the changes that you have made in our lives. God, and your affection for us is just never-ending, Lord, and you love Muslim people as much as you love us, God. Um, we ask, first of all, just for the, the tithes and the offerings, Lord, that as we give, uh, Lord, we know that you're pleased. And our, where our treasure is, our hearts will follow. So, God, as we give out, we give to you, Lord, I pray that our hearts would just be ablaze with what your heart um, is passionate about. So do that to us, for us, in us, God. And uh, we ask for blessing on all of the ministries that we support, Father. And I pray, Lord, for our body, that we would um, pray this month through this book. And God, that you would just give us a burden, a passion, a love for Muslim people. And we pray, Father, that this month, during Ramadan, that many would have visitations from Jesus, that they would be brought into relationship with authentic, spirit-filled Christians who will show them your love and share with them your good news. We love you, God, and we just ask you to manifest yourself among us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. John um, is going to come on up. We're going to be starting a new series starting today about living a meaningful life. And children, you are Awesome. Can we thank Stephanie? Yeah. yeah. If you guys could not figure it out, if you don't know who Stephanie is, she oversees our missions and outreach, the Great Commission, keeping us on point with the Great Commission. And uh, she needs, we need to pray for her to have a little more passion. Um, if you uh, want to give, you can give in this uh, offering box over here if you want to give a physical gift. You can also give online at gatheringplacechurch.org. You can also text 84321. So uh, I'm going to open this morning. I'm so excited about this new series that we are jumping into right now. 
I'm going to take about five minutes to set this up. And then Pastor Mark's going to come and give us the first installment on this series. And we're going to walk through this series as long as we want to. Just like we did with the Outpouring of the Holy Spirit series, which we just wrapped up. And that went for January, February, March, and April. And uh, it was just powerful. So today we're going to be talking about how to live a meaningful life. Uh, on Easter last week, I talked about how heaven is the only thing that you can bank on. Put all your marbles in that basket. Because everything on earth is unpredictable. People are unpredictable. Government's unpredictable. Church is unpredictable. Your spouse is unpredictable. Kids, parents. We do our best. But it's unpredictable. Heaven, nobody's arguing in heaven about anything. The Bible says that your word is settled forever in heaven, O Lord. It's in the earth where there's turmoil, where there's question marks, where there's debate. But there's no debate in heaven. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you can bank on it in heaven's bank that the day you die, you go straight to be with Jesus forever. But what about from here to there? What about from today? To the day that you see Jesus face to face. What about that life that you get to live? From the very beginning of time, after Adam and Eve fell, the questions, where did we come from? Who are we? Why are we here? And where did we go after we die? Those four questions have been the philosophical questions that mankind has been trying to answer since the fall in the garden. Well, the Bible has the answer to all those questions. That's why any follower of Christ that is confused about your purpose is disturbing. And I want to clarify that over this series. I want you to be crystal clear on what God's purpose is for your life. Because it's not ambiguous in the scriptures. We should be the clearest, most courageous, most purpose-filled people on the planet. Because we have the answer not just for going to heaven. We have the answer for how we should be living our lives now until we get to heaven. And everything you do that's in line with the Lord's plan for your life is being recorded and you will be rewarded for it when you get to heaven. Did you know that? I'm going to say that again. Everything that you're doing right now from this day forward that's in line with the will of God for your life is being recorded and is going to be rewarded when you see Jesus face to face in heaven. That's why we got to get on the stick. That's why we shouldn't be ambiguous about what the Lord's will is for our lives. Because it literally counts for eternity. Some of you just feel like you have fire insurance. That you're going to escape the flames of hell and you get to go to heaven. But in the meantime, you just get to do whatever you want. And that's just a huge mistake to live by that philosophy. You can't find that in the Word of God. So, uh, yesterday, uh, Chris Larkin, one of our youth pastors and I, uh, we went to a track meet for Josiah who, by the way, broke the state record for the 100 and the 200. And I'm going to pay for that later because he does not like the light shining on him. Well, quit breaking state records. No, don't. And, uh, and, and Sam, who did a phenomenal job running the 800 and the long jump. But, amen. But what, what was great for me was I was sitting with a, 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 a past, sorry, past, track star from Westview High School. Uh, Chris was breaking school records. And so Chris was sitting right next to me and he was explaining the details of the, the sport to me. I've gone to track meets. I go to my son's track meets. I went to my daughter's track meet when she was in high school. But I didn't fully understand the intricacies, the art of track, all the different heats that you can do and all the different elements to it. And he was explaining it to me in detail. And they caught my attention because it fits in perfectly with this new series we're going into. For example, he said, have you ever been on starting blocks before? I said, I'm not sure. He said, the starting blocks would enable you to, I don't remember. I barely remember what high school I went to. You stop, Adrena. So glad you're here today. And uh, he said, the starting blocks get you up on the toes and your weight's just proportioned right so you can get the best start you possibly can. The start is critical. It determines how you finish many times. 
Josiah was saying yesterday when he got done, he said, I got to work more on my start, Dad. We got to work on my start. How you start is critical. Some people haven't even started right yet. What is the start? Well, Jesus said, come and follow me. He is the start to how to live a meaningful life. Anything, any life lived outside of Christ is a question mark. We're just doing the best you can. Don't really know why you're here. Don't really know where you came from. Don't really know where you're going when you die. You're not sure about it. It's just gray and it's a question mark. I was talking to a teenager this week. They asked if they could talk with me. He has suicide ideation. He doesn't really know why he should even stay here. And he had very sincere but very straight questions. What's life all about? It's meaningless. You know, why, why should I stay here? What's the purpose? I'm so thankful I, was, I wasn't giving him vague answers. I'm so thankful that the Bible was so clear that I was able to give him very clear, substantive answers to what the meaning of life is all about. He represents millions of young people. He represents millions and millions of middle-aged people, older people all over the planet, especially over last year, what we went through as a global community. We all realize that life is fragile. That things are absolutely unpredictable and you cannot put your hope in anybody or anything on this side of heaven. But thank God we can put our hope in the kingdom of God. It's immovable, unshakable, eternally stable, and the king is upon the throne and he hasn't rattled at all. And when we align with him, we align with heaven, and therefore we have a... We have a platform from here to there that we get to run on. So you start with Jesus. What about after that? And I'm going to wrap this up and turn it over to Mark. What about after you start? Some of you haven't started right yet. You need to come to Christ. That's the starting point. You'll experience a peace you've never known before. And I'm going to tell you this straight up. You won't know who you are until you know who Jesus is. Because he's your creator. The apostle Peter... He wasn't an apostle at first. He was a fisherman. He had a fishing business. That was his career. That was his purpose. He thought, I'm a fisherman. That's what I am, and that's what I do. But then he met Jesus, and he said, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, yeah, and I'm changing your name and your occupation. You're now Peter. You're a rock, and you're now an apostle. Peter had no idea he was an apostle, but Jesus knew. But Peter didn't know that until he met Christ. You can't even start right until you meet Jesus. You won't know who you are until you know who Jesus is. Because only he knows who you truly are. Can I hear an amen? Somebody already started preaching just a few minutes ago. But then Chris said, but you know, after you get off the starting block, you know why they're doing long strides out there on the, uh, that part of the track way over across the field. It's an 800 meter race. And they do short strides when they come up here. I said, no, I, I don't know. That. And Josiah, he's doing his, his, his uh, adaptive track wheel bike, you know, he's going, but he keep makes it, keeps making adjustments to stay on the track. Just because you start with Jesus doesn't mean you're going to stay on track. You got to make adjustments. And that's what this whole series is about is what do I do after I start with Jesus? Jesus didn't say, just come to me. He said, come and follow me. That means everything you have, everything you own, every breath you breathe, every dollar you have, every skill set you have, it all belongs to Jesus. And you need to ask him, what do you want me to do with these things? Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, and I'm going to close with this. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon lived the first half of his life known as the wisest man who's ever lived. Why? Because he was fully submitted and committed to the Father, to God Almighty. He was the king of the kingdom of God. He would pray every day, Yahweh, Jehovah, God, what do you want me to do today? Help me lead your people. And God gave him wisdom that made him wiser than any person on the planet. God will do the same thing to you. He drops his wisdom into you. So the first half of his life, he lived in unprecedented wisdom the second half of his life he decided to do it differently he married too many women I'm sorry they were the wrong kind of women they weren't the women of God and too many <laughs> and <laughs> yeah and they got him to worship other gods 
You're surrounded in a culture right now. We are surrounded in a culture where we are being tempted to worship other gods. And Solomon started worshiping other gods. He got into the culture of the cultures around him, not the kingdom of God. And he lost his bearings. Many of you, many people watching online have lost your bearings. You've lost your, your, your GPS is not working. You have lost your way. Last week rocked you. It shocked you. And you're like, what, what, how do I live life now? So Solomon lived the second half of his life according to his own wisdom, his own dictates, his own flesh. He said, I withheld nothing from my own desires. I did whatever I wanted to do, whatever I wanted to do. And this is what he ended the book with, the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a book about meaninglessness, emptiness, vanity. He ends it with this. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark. He says, now all has been heard, verse 13, Ecclesiastes 12. Here is the conclusion of the matter. This is how you start right. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Thank God the blood of Jesus covers all of our evil. But there's a whole lot of good that we can and should be doing between now and the time that we get to heaven. And that's what we want to lead you in over the next weeks to come. Let's welcome Pastor Mark as he answers the first question, what does God want me to do with blank? And Mark's going to fill in the blank. Well, I'm really happy to have the privilege of starting this series. What does God want me to do with my blank? <laughs> Trina, I used to think I really missed you. You're not being here. Now, I'm not so sure. I'm kidding. I love that you're here. I love when you laugh, it makes me happy. Just absolutely makes me happy. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what this message is about. You're going to have to figure it out as we go. God, what do you want me to do with my blank? Back in the Middle Ages, there was a pseudoscience. It was called alchemy. Its purpose was twofold. They were looking for two things. They were looking for a process that would turn base metals into gold. Some substance, something that would turn base metals into gold. And they were looking for what they called the universal solvent. This would be something that no matter what you put into it, it would dissolve that something. You know, it never crossed their mind that if you have the universal solvent and whatever is placed within it is dissolved, how do you contain the universal solvent? Whatever container you put it in is going to be dissolved. These guys didn't deal in a lot of logic, okay? It was a pseudoscience. But they were looking for something, some substance that would turn any base metal into gold. You know, right before their eyes was the universal solvent, pretty much the universal solvent. It was around them all the time. They never recognized it for what it was. What's the universal solvent? water and there it was they never recognized it now there is a substance which will turn worthless things into incredibly valuable things there is something we have which will turn dross into gold but before we get there let's answer another question about life is life just or unjust? Is the world we live in fair or unfair? How many say unfair? You don't have to have lived very long to figure out that life is not fair. Some of us are born with genes that will take us to the Super Bowl and others with genes that will take us to the couch. Some of us are born into great wealth. Some of us are born into poverty. Some of us are very intelligent, others not so much. These gifts, these abilities are not handed out equally. And so we can say life is unfair. But there is something we all have which can be turned into gold. There is something we all have that can be turned into anything 
we want. And we all have the same amount of it fairly, no matter what. What is that something that can be translated into anything we deeply value, which all of us have the same amount of, and it's distributed perfectly, fairly, and justly, equally? What is it? I'm waiting for someone to, to have the courage to say it out loud. He did, but he didn't shout it. Time. It's time. It's about time. We all have the same amount of time. And what we choose to do with that time will determine what we really care about. It will determine the purpose and the point of our life. Is God the Lord of our time? I'm really glad I didn't hear a whole bunch of people say yes. Because to be honest, God is not the Lord of our time much of the time. He's the Lord of our Sunday mornings or the occasional this and that. But is He really the Lord of our time? And what would it look like if He were the Lord of our time? And what does He want from our time anyway? Time is the great equalizer. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be judged on the basis of the money we were born into or our athletic talent or our intellect or any of these things. That's all unfairly distributed. We will be judged by how we spent our time. Not on the basis of how gifted we were, but on how we spent our time. God judges fairly. There's only one question on the exam. How did you spend your time? You see, time, I want you to think about this. This is really important. Time is currency in the kingdom of God. Time is like a medium of exchange in the kingdom of God. It's like money. In fact, how do you spend your time? How do you invest your time? How do you save your time? How do you waste your time? Do you know that the language that we use for money is the same language we use for time? And they have a saying, time is money? No, money is time. Time is important. Time is the issue. It's a currency. You know, this is a very liberating thing that we all have the same amount of time. It's very liberating because if I'm born with a great deal of wealth, I can feel guilty about it. I'll be tempted to think of myself as better than other people. If I'm born with great athletic ability, I'll, tend to, I'll be tending to be proud and uh, seeing myself as more athletic, more able than others. But time is the great equalizer. I don't have to think of myself as better than other people or worse than other people. I have the same measure as everybody else. So, so do we all. I don't have to fear being less gifted. I don't have to fear being proud about being more gifted. But look, this freedom of equality of time carries with it a tremendous responsibility. I'm accountable for how I spend my time. Now, to figure this out, how should I spend my time? We need a principle. We need an idea. We need a concept which will overarch all of our choices about our time to help us to know how to spend it well. How do you uh, prioritize your time? The successful Christian life is about setting right priorities. How do we set right priorities about our time? Well, I always, this is a little theological thing that I do and it's really, really been helpful in my life. When I ask myself a hard question, and I'm not sure of the answer. I start to answer the question this way. 
what is most consistent with the character of God? In this question, what answer is closest to what God is really like? The nature of God. Because I want my life to conform as much as possible to the nature of God. So I say, what does God value most of all? Because whatever he values most of all is my hint about how I organize my priorities in my time. Quick question. What does God value most of all? Yeah. God values, more than anything else, relationship. I like to say this, and you've heard me say it too many times, but it bears repeating because it's always worth reminding ourselves, God doesn't value relationships. He is a relationship. He is three beings in love with one another. A triangle of love. Love in love with love in love with love in love with love. You ever notice how they treat each other? Jesus is bragging constantly about the Father and the Holy Spirit. And then the Father comes along and says, this is my son, listen to him, he's wonderful. And then the Holy Spirit says, you got to know Jesus, he's absolutely incredible. And Jesus says, oh, you can't wait till I leave, he'll come. They're always introducing each other like, he's more amazing than me, you should pay attention to him. <laughs> it's this triangle of love and love with love. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? It's his quintessential nature, boiled down to the deepest, most accurate thing we can say about God is this. He is a relationship of love. He is a relationship of love. So when we look at our time and we say, how should I spend my time? How should I invest my time? What am I saving my time for? Isn't it for relationships? Is there anything more precious? Look, Jesus said, the disciples got really excited when they came into Jerusalem and they saw the temple. They said, wow, this is incredible. Look, look, at, these, look at these bricks in the temple. Look at this architecture. Isn't this incredible architecture? What did Jesus say? All this will disappear. Only what is eternal will remain. As they're looking at this architecture, a group of these guys looking at this architecture and going, wow, all that is going to disappear. What's going to remain for those guys? Each other. When all said and done, all they have is the relationships they made. They're eternal. We're going to spend eternity with one another. Those relationships begin now. Our relationships are everything to him. So we're going to prioritize relationships. Then I ask myself another simple question. What categories of relationships do you have in your life? What are the relationships in your life? In, in broad, broad categories. Relationship with, relationship with, relationship with. What are they? Number one. Relationship with Jesus. God. Because that relationship is going to last forever. It's your primary relationship. Then what's your next relationship? Family. Okay. And then what's your next relationship? Others. The people you work with, your neighbors, your extended family, your faith family. So we've got God, we've got family, Husband, wife, children, nuclear family, extended family, neighbors, people you work with, friends. Of course, your faith family is huge, absolutely huge. You know, Jesus once redefined family. He was teaching in a house that was full of people. His nuclear family, his mother, brother waiting outside they couldn't get in it was too crowded and she said go tell Jesus go tell Jesus his family's waiting outside like you're going to pull some strings here because hey you know I'm related to I, I got a backstage pass my son's in the band I got a backstage pass let me in so someone sneaks up to Jesus and says your 
families outside, they want to come in, there's not room. Families outside, what did Jesus say? What did he say, people? This is radical. I mean, did he redefine family or what? He said, family for me are the people in this room who are seeking the will of the Father. Oh, man. That's harsh. He just redefined for us family. You know, your faith family is as important as your nuclear family. Your brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not going to go there. That's, I, that, that's a whole, that would be another series of sermons on how do we do family as a faith family. But that's not my point today. What's my point today? What, what, what's Mark going to say next? Where is this thing going? Where, where, where logically would it go? Relationships are really important. God is a relationship. Therefore, relationships should be the center of how we spend our time. So where's Mark going to go next about how we should spend our time? Come on, give me the predictable. Hmm? Eating. <laughs> Guys, I've lost all this weight and you still think I'm a, I'm a food addict. I'm a recovering food addict. Oh, you guys, you're all asleep. Come on, what's the predictable thing? We're going to talk about how we spend our time. Of course, this is what he's going to say next. What's he going to say next? Come on. What? Yeah, yeah, of course he's going to talk about spending time with God, people. Come on, that's completely predictable. How many sermons have we heard that? A thousand. What are we being reminded constantly? You've got to have a quiet time. Get your life together. Spend time with God. Get in the Word. That's not what I'm going to say next. You missed a whole nother relationship. You missed it. Okay, we got God. Absolutely, without question, that's trite. That's a truism. We've got the family, no question. Husband, wife, no question. That's a truism. The kids, depends on their behavior. <laughs> Teenage years, I never knew the son. I never knew the daughter. We'll wait till they're 22 and then we'll readopt them after they've been to military school. <laughs> Friends. Extended family, neighbors, co-workers, blah, 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 blah. Those are all these relationships. There's still one missing. There's one more relationship in your life that's really, really important, and you're not even seeing it. And this is the nature of the problem. Thank you, Phil. Could you please say it out loud? Me. Your relationship with yourself. Your relationship with yourself. Do you have a relationship with yourself? Yeah. Don't you talk to yourself? Don't you correct yourself? Don't you think about yourself? Let me ask you a question. How well do you know yourself? How well do you know yourself? How do you know that your impression of yourself is accurate? What if your self-image is not accurate? What if, what, if you see, what if you see yourself better than you are? Please tell me how seeing yourself better than you are is going to affect your relationship with God. How will seeing yourself better than you are affect your relationship with your wife or your husband or your kids or your neighbors or your friends or your co-workers? How will seeing yourself worse than you are... See, there's really only two mistakes we make. We either consistently see ourselves as better than we are and how does that affect all of our relationships? Or we see ourselves as worse than we are, and how does that affect all of our relationships? What's the, what's the devil's agenda 
in your life regarding your self-image? Which would he prefer? That you think of yourself better yourself or worse than you are? Better than you are or worse than you actually are? Which does, which does say, Satan really want? Trick question. Doesn't matter. Either one. In fact, all he cares about is that you flip from one to the other as often as you possibly can and that you don't stop in the middle and get it right. Guys, is this uh, dawning on you? Is there a little light going off on the dash? Knowing yourself accurately is essential to quality relationships in all the other areas of your life. Your relationship with God, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your children, your relationship with your friends, your relationship with your faith family. You can't do them well if you are deceived one way or the other about who you really are. So, if time is the resource which we can turn into anything that we value, and relationships matter to God above all things because they're eternal, because you're eternal, then how should we spend and invest our time in our relationship with ourselves? What would it look like? Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Romans 12, 3, with sober judgment. Now he's focusing there on pride. He's focusing there on thinking better of yourself than you actually are. But listen, when he says think of yourself with sober judgment, the Greek actually means accurately. Think of yourselves accurately. Think of yourselves with a sound mind. Don't think of yourself more highly or lesser than you are. Be accurate in your self-appraising. There's a buzzword going around in psychological literature these days called self-awareness. What I'm saying is that self-awareness is essential. An accurate view of yourself is essential to successful relationships. Psychologists telling us the same thing. What is self-awareness? Here's how I define it. It's the knowledge of my strengths and my weaknesses. It's a knowledge of my passion, my temperament, my dreams, my disappointments, and my as yet unhealed brokenness. It's an understanding of my sin and my areas of temptation. My attitudes and how they affect my, my actions and my choices. Now, we all admit this to be true, right? That it's important to know yourself as you really are. But do you know that few of us are willing to take the journey of the long look inside? Before I was a Christian, I really didn't like myself. And I spent every night of the week, and I'm not exaggerating, high school, university, beginning of my legal career, law school, the works, I spent every night trying to find people to be with so I didn't have to be with myself. Because I really didn't like what I saw when I was alone. I just kept myself continually distracted with other relationships so I wouldn't have to take the long look inside. We have a human reluctance, people. We have a human reluctance to examine our lives soberly. And this leads to what I would call blind spots. 
blind spots are those attitudes and actions that we choose to ignore. The legal system had a, an idea of, of negligence, and negligence law called it willful blindness, where you willfully chose not to see a consequence of an action. You remained willfully blind to it, went ahead and did it, somebody got hurt. Blindness, when it's willful, is not an excuse. Beneath willful blindness is self-deception. And let me tell you something honestly, folks, and you won't like this, but I really, with all of my heart, believe it's true. Self-deception is our default position. Jeremiah 17, the human heart is deceitful above all things. Who can fathom it? See, at the core of our issue is self-deception, and underneath that is pride. Pride does not want the long look inside because pride will pay the price of change when we realize that something has to change. Do we really? Mark must be exaggerating. I mean, he just must be exaggerating. Do we really avoid the long look inside? Is that really our human nature? Psychologists at the University of Virginia and Harvard conducted a study in which students were required to sit alone for 15 minutes. 15 minutes. But they took away their iPhones and their iPads and their tablets and their laptops. They had to simply sit alone for 15 minutes. And they had to come to the place where the study was taking place, do it every day, 15 minutes a day, that's it for several months. That's it. What's the big deal? 15 minutes with yourself without distraction? Just 15 minutes. They were given an option to sitting with themselves for 15 minutes. They didn't have to. But if they chose not to, they could avoid it by giving themselves a very unpleasant electric shock. And before the study was commenced, they showed all of them the electric shock. They demonstrated it. Every single student said, I would pay money not to have that happen to me. So the study commenced. What percentage of the men chose the shock instead of sitting alone for 15 minutes? 66%. 25% of the women chose the shop rather than sitting alone with themselves for 15 minutes. One guy chose the shock over a hundred times. Well, the researchers thought, you know, maybe this is a millennial thing. You know, we blame the millennials for everything, so we might as well blame them for the outcome of this. So they took the same study to a farmer's market with a demographic going from little to old and a church. They went to a church and said, can we do this study on your church people? You know, there was, now they left out the electric shock. You can't do the electric shock at a farmer's market and you can't do the electric shock at church. But they did the same study with the church and the farmer's market. The results were exactly the same. Demographic didn't make any difference at all. Everybody reported sitting alone is unpleasant. So what's the antidote? How do we come to truly know ourselves accurately? So when we bring ourselves to God, we bring the real person to God. You know, God can't fix what we won't admit. God doesn't fix the things we won't admit. He seeks our permission to fix it, our involvement to fix it. The more honest we are with God, the deeper our relationship with God, the more truly we bring the genuine self to God, the more he has access to healing and fixing. So what's the antidote to this human aversion? to being alone with ourselves, to self, 
awareness, to seeing ourselves as we truly are, to answering those questions, what about my passions? What about my temperament? What about my fears? What about my unmet needs? What about my unanswered prayers? What about my dreams that haven't been realized? What about all those things? Well, the answer is time. Time spent with myself being real with myself. Time spent with God being real with God about who I really am. It's about honesty. It's about facing these things bravely. Say, I'm willing to talk about this, Lord. I'm willing to ask myself these questions and I'm willing to see the answers, whether I like them or not. It's time spent in reflection asking myself this question. How has my history made me the person I am today? And what in my history needs to be brought to God and healed? And we do that, when we do that, we reach certain conclusions and we bring that to God. And we wait on Him and we hear His interaction, how He sees us, what He's prepared to do, the healing that He's ready to bring. Wow. That was painful. I'm sure glad I came to church today. And all I wanted was just to come and feel better. And now I feel worse. You know, sometimes they have to break the bone in the nose to fix the bone in the nose because it was broken and it's set wrong. Sometimes surgery is necessary because you can't get beyond the infirmity, the problem without surgery. Nobody says, boy, I can't wait for surgery. But we all say, I can't wait for the recovery and what follows it. So I'm just going to suggest that you carve out some time to be with yourself and look. Ask those selves, yourself a question. Hey, like John, it's that kid. He's lost the will to live. He doesn't have a purpose. He's completely confused. Life has no meaning because he has not seen himself as God sees him. If he saw himself as he really was, he would find God and God would give him a purpose. That's what happened to me. I was thinking about suicide too. But we can't get there without being honest with ourselves. So I leave that with you. As you're spending your time Think about spending some time with yourself to get to really know yourself. Not to love yourself too much and not to hate yourself too much, just to honestly get to know this is who I really am. These are my unanswered questions. These are my needs. These are the emotional issues that I deal with on a regular basis. These are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. God, tell me, what do you think about me? Well, I've suggested that we break up into small groups. And uh, those leaders that are here that we contacted, Shelly contacted you about leading a group this morning. Could you stand up? Stephanie, Mark, John, I think you were on that list. Stand up. <laughs> People have to be able to see you. Uh, Mark Nelson, you too. Did, did we send you some questions? I've got them right here. Anyone that needs them, I've got them. So guys, why don't you find one of these leaders, cluster around social distance, and we've got some questions to ask ourselves about time and about knowing ourselves. So if you'd like to be part of one of those groups, come and do it. And uh, if not, get the kids and we're done. Let me let me uh, do this right before we break into the small groups. This is all Stan.
as Mark was uh, teaching that, I was thinking about my opening illustration of track and an athlete understanding themselves, uh, their weaknesses, their strengths, the right um, activity and, and, and track. Having a sports psychologist is what enables that athlete to uh, win. The Apostle Paul says that in the Christian right race, we are to run in such a way that we win. And that's what this was about. Spending your time understanding yourself so that you can win. And uh, so that was a brilliant application to how to spend time. Unpredictable. I don't think any of you expected you to go there. No. Nope. And uh, it's very thought-provoking. But so smart. Because if you don't understand yourself, you end up spending your time in ways you wouldn't have if you had a, a, right. a clear understanding of yourself. So I want to say... Um, some of you may have not received Christ yet. Some of you online listening and watching, you have not received Jesus yet. You haven't even started right yet. You don't know who you are because you don't know who Jesus is. And before we, uh, before we talk about what to do after you follow Christ, I want to invite those who have not yet chosen to follow Christ to receive Him right now as your Savior for the forgiveness of your sins and a brand new start for a brand new life with God. So can everybody just bow your heads right now for a moment? I just want to pray this prayer. If you've never come to Jesus before and you want to do that now, just pray this prayer out loud. Just let it roll off your lips and say, Dear God, I am receiving your Son Jesus right now. I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins. I ask you to give me a brand new start. And I ask you now to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I yield my life to you now. Everything I have, everything I am, I am yours. Now some of you, you've given your life to Jesus before, but you have fallen away. You're, a, you're that track athlete and you've crossed lanes and you're going four-wheeling. And you need to get right back in line. So I want to pray this prayer for those of you who have already received Jesus. But you need to come back to your first love. I love that song you sang, Colette. Um, I am sorry. I came to you with my own agenda. And uh, let's take, bring me back to where we started. Some of you need to come back to your first love where you started. So this prayer is for you. So just close your eyes. And just say this, Jesus, I started with you, but I got off track. I'm coming home. I rededicate myself to you. You're not just my Savior. You're my Lord. Now I'm ready to follow you very closely for the rest of my life. Amen. Amen. If you prayed either one of those prayers, will you just raise your hand right where you are and say, I prayed. I prayed that prayer with you. Praise God. Anybody else, just raise your hand and say, I pray that prayer. Praise God. Praise God. Awesome. Amen. Let's thank God for the power of the gospel, the work of the Holy Spirit. For those of you visiting today and you weren't aware of us bringing to the small groups, that that's uncomfortable for you, there's no obligation. But I tell you, it's a powerful way. The one thing we need more than anything right now is connectivity, connection, community. So you're welcome to join a small group. And uh, there's facilitation questions, and uh, it's really powerful. If you're not comfortable with that, you, of course, do not have to do that. But we're going to do it right here. There's going to be yeah. groups around here. If you have kids, you need to go grab your kids and bring them back and be part of the small group. And we're going to do this for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to uh, break for the day. So John will lead a group, say, over there. And I'll lead a group over here, and Mark will lead one there, and Mark will lead one there. Stephanie will lead one over there. So uh, just bring your chairs, cluster around, social distance, and uh, we'll have a quick discussion and application of this.
Thank <laughs> you. 